Welcome to Health, Wellbeing and Lifestyle, where experts in the field inform, educate and inspire the community to be healthier, more balanced and live the lifestyle they love. Our first guest today, Michelle Wolfe, is a naturopath, author and lecturer, and the topic we'll be discussing is how toxins in our environment can affect our digestive health. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, Megan. How do toxins in our environment affect our digestive health? Yeah, good question. Well, nowadays we've got over 84,000 registered chemicals that weren't there uh, over 100 years ago. So we're having to deal and adapt to that as human beings. And in particular, it puts a big strain on the liver because the liver is constantly detoxing what we put on our skin, what we breathe in, um, toxins that we produce in our body from our own uh, digestion or from stress. So you've got um, all sorts of environmental toxins. You've got toxins that are in food, toxins that are in the home that are off-gassing from paints, from furniture, toxins in uh, clothes, unless they're organic cotton, um, and toxins that are on foods, particularly if they're wrapped in plastics. Um, also, there's toxins in different sprays that we use, like um, cockroach sprays and fly sprays. Um, and, and we have to deal uh, with all of that. So with uh, food wrapped in plastic, the softer the plastic, the more toxic it is. So something like uh, glab wrap would be more toxic than a hard plastic. And when it's warm or heated, then that becomes more toxic. So if you've got uh, a water bottle in a plastic container on your front seat and it's a 35 degree day, then the phthalates from that plastic will go into the water and that disrupts the hormonal system. The liver has to try and detox that and that puts pressure on the digestion. Um, in food, we used to have a, a whole food diet without food additives and, and preservatives and, and so on. And now um, the food in industry is, has developed food that lasts a long, long time that never goes off on the on the food shelves. Well, that has an impact on the system as well um, because it's it's foreign to the body and the liver has to detox that. And then the everyday things we do in our lifestyle, um, from getting up in the morning to going to bed, we can use a whole range of toxic products in the home. So uh, makeup, deodorant toothpaste, hairsprays, um, and cleaning products. So what you've got under your kitchen sink or in your bathroom cabinet is not necessarily healthy. When you buy new furniture or you use commercial paint, that's often off-gassing for a period of time and we're breathing that in. When you get a new car, I've recently got a new car and um, in order to help get rid of the toxins, had to heat the car up and use um, carbon filters in, in the car. So, you know, unfortunately, a lot of things are not made uh, with natural fibres. We don't have a lot of natural wood products now for um, furniture and um, clothing isn't natural. And where we live, we're breathing it in. Um, in the home, there can sometimes be things like uh, mold that can really affect people. So once you've got mold in the home and it's visible, there are a whole lot of spores in the air that you're actually breathing in that's very harmful to the health. Uh, so that can be harmful to the digestive health, but also overall he health and for the brain and you can get symptoms of chronic uh, fatigue and so on. Um, and sometimes people get repeated chest infections or, or asthma from mould. So those are a few examples of toxins that just are an added burden in particular to the liver. The kidneys and the skin and the lungs are all, and your bowel are all organs that eliminate toxins. So you want to be able to free them up as much as possible. That's really good information, Michelle. How can we avoid toxic products in our home? I think having more awareness and starting somewhere. So if you have uh, food and you 
can't go straight away to all organic for food. You could start with the Dirty Dozen, so you can look that up on the internet. So it's the 12 most highly sprayed fruits and vegetables because pesticides can have a big effect on our digestive system and overall system. And start to look at more natural deodorants, toothpaste, products that you put on your skin, products that you eliminate insects with, there are totally natural ones. Cleaning products, you can start with um, more economical products like bicarb of soda and microfiber cloths. Um, many shops sell cleaning white vinegar um, and they are very effective for cleaning. You can also use essential oils for nice smells instead of uh, false perfumes, both if you're perfuming a room or if you're putting that on your body. So for example, rose essential oil is the essential oil that we would use as the most potent antidepressant, but it also is a really beautiful smell. So you're, it's therapeutic uh, as well. And avoiding as much as you can foods that are wrapped in plastic and drinks that are in plastic. You know, if you're lowering your load, you're lowering the impact that you're having on your liver and your overall digestion. Do you have any extra advice for our viewers? Yes, so those things that I mentioned, also if you want to look into it more deeply, there are various air filters available so that you can keep the air quality in your house really good. Um, in particular, if you're living near a busy road or if you've got uh, furniture that's off-gassing or you've recently painted your house, to be extra careful if you're planning to get pregnant because um, it's been diagnosed in the cord blood of newborn babies, a, a huge amount of toxins that they've got when life has only just started. And to consult someone like my, myself or a, another naturopath to build that awareness so that you can keep taking steps to avoid those chemicals. Thanks, Michelle. If you'd like to know more about how toxins in our environment affect our digestive system and Michelle Wolf, please go to her webpage on our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au. And after the break, we have another interesting guest with another interesting topic. Stay tuned. After the break, animal communicator and therapist Carolyn Pope talks animal communication and breaking down the barriers. Welcome back. Now we have Carolyn Pope in the studio and she is an animal communicator and therapist. And we're going to be discussing animal communication, overcoming barriers. Hi, Carolyn, welcome. Hey. Um, now I wanted to ask if are different human languages a barrier to animal communication? So if you were working on communicating with an animal that wasn't from an English speaking country, how does that affect things? Only from the point of view, I sadly only have English. I don't speak a second language. Providing the person on the other end can also speak English as a second language, it's not an issue because the animal doesn't speak a language per se, they use telepathics. So telepathics doesn't have a language. The biggest problem I actually find with my international people is simply some of the accents I can struggle a little bit to understand. And apparently I have a very broad Aussie accent and very few can understand me. That seems to be the biggest barrier. So it's a human issue, not it's an animal issue. It's a human issue, issue <laughs> not an animal issue. How does it work? How do you communicate with animals? For those of you that have seen The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, great uh, trilogy, think of the babble fish. For those that haven't, the babble fish was something that you put in your ear and it would swim around and it would simultaneously translate any language right throughout the universe. And essentially that's what happens because it's all about thought. If you're, say, a diplomat and you want to say something to someone who only speaks Russian and someone who only speaks Dutch. The thought pattern's the same, what you want to say might be the same, but the languages are different. So the animal's thought pattern 
to me is always going to be the same. It just happens that I only speak English, therefore I need another English speaking person on the other end of the phone. The animal doesn't have a language per se, it's all telepathics, it's all energetic thought. How does the difference between species affect animal communication? Hugely. That's the biggest job of um, and any animal communicator is advocating for species difference. You're not going to roll in horse poo and eat it. At least I'm assuming you're not. <laughs> you know, your dog will. Dog's not going to jump on Google and Google animal communication. My, one of my cats once said to me, murdering birdies is good for my stress levels. You should try it sometime. Murdering birdies wasn't going to do anything for my stress levels. Drinking coffee wasn't going to do anything for the cat. And everything is within species. You can't blame a dog for being a dog any more than if a horse gets a fright, it's going to shy or bolt because that's what horses do. And the biggest problem is people that consider themselves animal communicators that have no species awareness. I remember one lady and look, she was a human psychologist. She was very good, but she'd been speaking to these people with this very, very troubled dog. And they told me what they were doing and I just went, no, that's crap. You actually do the complete opposite. And within five minutes, that dog was lying down. It hadn't laid down for three weeks because the signals they were giving to the dog was actually upsetting the dog. When you understand the species, you understand how to change your signals because in any animals like a computer, they can only go by the information you're giving. And you're giving any animal information 24-7, 365. The problem is we're not aware of the information we're giving because we can only see things from our species parameters. My computer guy puts it really well. He says it's like giving Mac commands to a Windows computer and going, why isn't this working? They're two different operating systems. A cat and a dog and a human have three different operating systems and then add that to every species. So could you please give our viewers some advice on communicating with their animals? Are there any general things to look out for? Start with someone else's because you're too close to your own. In the same way doctors doesn't treat their own children or a clairvoyant doesn't generally read. You need to know you're able to communicate and you know your own too well. You can't detach what is you from what is them. And also you need feedback. You need to know whether you're on the right trail. I mean, having said that, sometimes you'll get something that's just so weird, you couldn't possibly have thought it up. And that's when you know it's coming from the animal. But most of the time, practice on others and get others to practice on yours and start with it that way. Because it's like, you know, a kid's not often going to tell his mum what's going on, but he'll tell a third party. It's exactly the same. So work with that to start with and build up the relationship and the rapport from there. When you say practice, like what sort of things would you do, say, with a friend's dog? What would you observe? They might, for example, say, all right, here's a list of four questions. See what answers you get. And that's a good one for you but they need to be answers that the owners know. For example, um, dogs in shelters. Any dog in a shelter will tell you anything it needs to to get out of there rather than being euthanized. But also people like to get stuck in the past and you know, oh, it's because he was a shelter dog till he was six months old. Well, yeah, you've had him tw 12 years and he's still a brat, what's your excuse? People like to keep their animals in victim mode, but they can't know what's going on. So there's no point in asking what happened while you're in the shelter or how many homes or whatever have you had before when you're starting to learn if the owner can't validate that because they need to be questions that the owner 100% knows. So that's you asking in English the, the dog a question. Yeah, you might give me a list of four questions and it might be where does Fido like, to, what does Fido like to eat? What's where does he like to go? Some of his favorite activities. And then I'll take a photo and you know, tune in, write down the answers and give them to you. And you can go, those two are right. No idea why you said that. I'll try feeding it to him, see whether he likes it or not and get back to you. Because you need to know you're on the right path. And it's like a muscle. You don't use it, you lose it. But 
start with little bits because you don't go out and run a marathon. As Tuvok used to say, you don't get out of a wheelchair and do advanced aerobics. You don't run a marathon to start with. Little bits and build up. And that's the thing. If I said to you, we're going to learn ancient Egyptian or Latin, no one's going to expect to be fluent in a day or, and using the Egyptian, go in and read Tut's tomb. And yet everybody expects to be able to communicate fluently and instantaneously within a day. And sadly, for 99.99% of the population, it takes work. But the rewards are always worth it. Well, that is fascinating. Thank you so much, Carolyn. You're very welcome. If you want to know more about Carolyn Pope, and language and communication with animals, please go to her webpage on our website at healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au and we'll be right back after this break with another amazing guest. Stay tuned. After the break, health, life and love coach Heather Bell Murphy is talking about the secrets of long-lasting love. Welcome back. Today we have Heather Bell Murphy on the show, a health, life and love coach. And our topic is the secrets of long lasting love. Welcome to the show, Heather. And tell us how many secrets are there? There's actually quite a few, Kirsty, which I'm sure you can appreciate. If I can offer some great advice as a bit of a mentor and being pretty seasoned in love myself, Love is a skill like anything, you know, and I think, I think there's been a cultural perception or some of us who may have been raised with a religious overtone, and certainly I had an early Christian upbringing, that love just, you know, it's just this thing that comes naturally. So I've certainly grown up through relationships and I've gotten better at it. And, you know, there are, there are obviously some, some skills which are really important to create a sustainable loving life and then you know a long lasting juicy vital fun passionate romantic relationship number one is definitely to fall in love with yourself first and to know your strengths and identify your weaknesses now if you know that you've got a really flaky bad habit for example, being bad with money, that's probably something which, is, which, which you prefer to address sooner rather than later because that's one of those things that can make sustainable love tricky. A great saying is, when financial hardship comes through the front door, t love tends to fly out the window. So that's one thing, you know, it's like, being aware of what your strengths and weaknesses are and if you can address those weaknesses or or it's something that can be shared with a partner you know because maybe you don't carry the financial range of, reins in the relationship perhaps you know that's a job for the partner if it's something that that a particular person is pouring another thing is so along with that self-love is identify your partner's strengths and weaknesses this is a really common actually it's it's almost like we're entering the time with all the online dating you know and the tinder love it's almost like entering the menu log love stage where relationships are starting and finishing you know within a few hours so there is definitely learning dating skills for women in particular and this was a big 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 mistake was that I didn't give myself permission to identify who I really wanted to be with. I tended to let the other person just choose me and then go along with it. And so I would end up in relationships where I was obviously with the wrong person. And then being young and naive and you know, lacking skill in that area and thinking that love was unconditional, which is a really big thing for, for women, I would be trying to make an, a bad match work. And then thinking, you know, I, I need to just work harder at it, work harder at it. It was actually just that I was with the wrong person all along because it was all a hormone driven, you know, um, that, um, that friction of, you know, passion and physicality but really the long-term juice just wasn't there and it was actually never there to start with. 
So there is a thing about giving yourself permission to choose, knowing what your strengths are, knowing what you like. Heather, does unconditional love exist? I would answer probably no, especially when it comes to intimate, sustainable, you know, long-term love, because this comes down to house training, you know, which is about doing our part in the relationship. There's you're probably not looking at a long-term love picture if somebody thinks that it's okay to just, you know, sit on the couch and eat chocolate, you know, it's probably not part of a sustainable long, long love picture. So definitely the role where, you know, and it's part of a healthy love life plan for, you know, whatever an end result looks like in a relationship. So people are going to play their parts. And what tips do you have for our audience? Definitely, I would say have a love plan together, you know, and make time for each other. So, you know, I, f I find it, it quite a common thing that when people have been in relationship for a few years, they can get into the pattern of taking each other for granted, which may look like there's never date night. You know, there's never date night for intimacy. It's not planned. There is also that plan of that end result about who you want to be in the relationship and then how your relationship is going to look like. I personally, I love receiving flowers. I think it's an incredibly sensual and sexy act. And so, you know, he brings, he gives me roses on a regular basis. Bit of a surprise in there, which is really nice. So it's never like it's a spontaneous Tuesday every week because you set a calendar to it or something. You know, but it's, it's a really lovely surprise. However, I've got friends. Now that was part of my juicy fantasy little movie that I played out in here before we met that now projects out here. I've got friends who don't like holding hands, don't like getting flowers. You know, they think, what's the point of receiving something that's going to be dead in a week? So that's not part of their plan, which is fine. So they've got a different plan. So of course, it all depends on choosing what we like to start with and then being capable of receiving it. Now, women receiving is a massive, massive secret and also a gift to a man. I've got friends and I've got friend, those kinds of Facebook friends where they'll be posting, you know, when a man loves a woman, he'll give her this and you know, hold her and do this and then they can't receive a cup of coffee or they can't receive the offer of a ride home. So receiving for women, which goes into our self-love, being the fountain of love, not the well of sacrifice. It's a huge thing. My partner knows when he gives me things that I really love, you know, love receiving them. And, and also that I'm going to honor him in having given to me. That's a big thing as well. Thank you so much, Heather. They were some lovely and insightful tips. And if you want more information on Heather Bell Murphy and the secrets to long lasting love, go to her webpage on our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au. That is the end of our show. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next week. If you'd like to know more about our show, please like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel.